Hello and welcome to the research podcast from Georgia State University, available wherever podcasts are found. In each episode, we highlight interesting and innovative research happening at Georgia State. We feature a different faculty member and a different topic each month, so you can learn more about research taking place across the university. I'm Jennifer Rainey Marquez, your host and Associate Director of Research Communications at Georgia State. My guest in this episode is Jonathan Todras, Distinguished University Professor of Law and co-author of the new book, Preventing Child Trafficking, A Public Health Approach, which was recently published by Johns Hopkins University Press. Professor Tadras has spent his career studying issues affecting children's rights and child well-being, and his book explores the depth and breadth of trafficking's impact on children, as well as the limitations of current strategies used to counter these, this exploitation. Today, he's going to talk about how the field of public health can inform new approaches to preventing, identifying, and responding to child trafficking. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. So first, I thought we could give listeners some background on child trafficking, and I'm hoping that you can talk a little bit more about what you mean by the word trafficking and also maybe give us a sense of its scale. Sure. At its most basic, human trafficking and child trafficking involve the exploitation of another human being. The legal definition has three components. So you need an act uh, that could be recruiting, harboring somebody, transporting somebody, the means by which you do it, uh, which is force, fraud, or coercion, uh, is what is required for human trafficking. And then the purpose, it has to be for exploitation, whether that's in the sex industry or in another sector of society. Uh, One important point is child trafficking is a little bit different. For child trafficking, you don't need to prove force, fraud, or coercion, because as we know, children do not have the capacity to consent under the law. So you simply need a, an act, a requisite act, that is recruiting, transporting, harboring somebody, uh, and that has to be done for the purpose of exploitation. In terms of scale, it is a problem that touches all countries. It is present in both urban areas and suburban areas and also rural areas. Uh, and here in the United States, we've had cases in all 50 states, in the District of Columbia, in some of the overseas territories as well. So it's really widespread. It also implicates all sectors of society. So you often hear about trafficking as being something involving sex and uh, into prostitution. And that's certainly part of human trafficking. Uh, But trafficking also occurs for labor. That can be in agriculture, mining, construction. It can be in the supply chains for the clothing we wear or the, the the food that's Uh, delivered to our tables. Uh, It can be in the hospitality industries. um, So hotels and restaurants may have trafficked labor. Um, So it's really touching upon nearly every sector, if not every sector. And then finally, uh, the numbers question is one that everyone asks. And we, um, we have a fair amount of research on that, but it's still evolving. We don't know for sure how many individuals there. There are a number of studies Uh, But each of the studies that exist today have some limitations. Uh, And so we don't have an exact number of how many individuals are trafficked uh, at any point in time. We do know, however, it is widespread and it is touching upon every country. And here in the United States, it affects every state. So let's talk a bit about the current approach toward child trafficking, which in your book, uh, you say typically involves engaging law enforcement to go after perpetrators and then social services to assist victims or survivors. Um, What about this current approach is not working according to the research that you've done? Well, you're right, there's a lot of work that has been done. Uh, In the last 20 years, we've seen a huge increase in the number of entities and organizations and individuals involved in combating child trafficking and human trafficking more broadly. Uh, But despite all those efforts, and um, some of them are really tireless efforts. Despite that, there's no evidence that trafficking has declined in that time. Um, And I think part of that, quite frankly, is because we don't have good research. And so we don't know for sure. We don't have baseline data that tells us 20 years ago how many people were trafficked. And so it's hard to measure. Um, But part of it is also because most of our effort to date is really about responding to the problem after harm has occurred. So prosecutions, while important, 
happen after a crime has been committed. And assistance to survivors, while essential, is again helping individuals only after the fact. Um, so both of those things are important, uh, but this is really where public health methods can help because they emphasize prevention. And how is this public health approach different and potentially better, more effective? Right. So to be clear, I think a public health approach and the methodologies from pro public health are, are essential to addressing trafficking, but I'm not calling for it to replace and us to give up all other efforts. Right. Um, but what a public health, there are three elements that I would mention. First, the public health emphasis on prevention. We should be trying to prevent harm from occurring. And that is sort of public health 101. When, they, when you think about contagious disease outbreaks, um, public health officials don't wait till there's an outbreak and then announce, we're going to find out who's responsible and we'll hold them accountable. Uh, what they do instead is they work on preventing the harm from occurring. So that means immunizing a community so the disease outbreak doesn't occur at all. And we should have the same mentality when it comes to trafficking. We should think about how can we strengthen communities so that exploitation doesn't happen in the first place. The second piece uh, that I think is really important from a public health standpoint is the public health has an emphasis on evidence-based research. As I said earlier, um, there's a lot we still don't know, and there's a lot we don't know about how effective certain programs are. Um, public health, the public health emphasis on evidence-based research and on evaluation of laws and programs can help us distinguish between whether we are doing something effective or whether we are just doing something. Uh, and then finally, uh, public health emphasizes addressing the underlying attitudes and behaviors that lead to harm. Um, and we need to spend more time on that. And why is it that some kids are more vulnerable than others? What's driving uh, other things that lead people into trafficking? Um, we need to get at those underlying issues, the sort of root causes, uh, and public health has a wealth of experience doing that. So as you just said, it's, you know, it, part of it is about better understanding what makes children or adults vulnerable to trafficking, but you also say that we need to better understand what's driving the demand for trafficking on the sort of the opposite side of that coin. And why is that important? Well, I think both sides are important. And, um, you know, the, the simplistic answer or overly simplistic answer is that traffickers are, are causing trafficking. Um, but that's a bit like saying drug kingpins are causing the drug trade. They are certainly key el elements of the drug trade, um, but the demand for drugs is what drives the drug trade. Um, and in human trafficking, it's the demand for the goods and services that exploited individuals produce that really drives it. If there wasn't a market for, the, for this exploitation, um, then it would go away. Um, what's driving it, people often think of... Uh, who's driving demand, it's um, individuals, it's men in dark alleys driving sex trafficking and that those sort of stereotypical um, portrayals of sex trafficking. Um, but again, as sex, sex trafficking is just one piece, uh, and even there, it's not just the sort of um, deviance in dark alleys that are driving that. Uh, but, but the bigger issue and the one that we can relate to is the food we eat the clothing we buy, mm -hmm. we drive the demand. All of us wants to pay uh, as little as possible for good quality clothing, for food and, and the like. And the reality is when you push prices down enough, um, somebody's likely getting exploited in the supply chain. Now they may be exploited in a way that doesn't technically meet the definition of trafficking, um, but some of them are trafficked uh, and we should pay attention to that. And so that can mean a variety of things. It can mean looking at what roles consumers can play in making better choices. Uh, and that can mean exploring how do we ensure consumers have the information they need to make good choices. It also can be about business to business pressure and having businesses move to better practices. Again, public health research helps us understand what motivates change in behavior. Uh, and from that research, we can sort of modify programs and adapt them to the human trafficking setting. Um, so hopefully we can incentivize and encourage people to make better choices 
and move away from the demand that drives trafficking. Mm -hmm. Um, your book also offers some guidance for professionals who are trying to build programs that can help prevent child trafficking. Um, and I know there's a lot there to unpack, but I'm wondering if you can give us maybe some of the most important pieces that you think need to be incorporated into these types of programs. Sure. Well, what we, one of the things that we call for uh, is a comprehensive integrated approach. Um, and one way to achieve that is to take a step back and, and, and better understand the problem. And we use the socio-ecological -eco model to do that. The socio-ecological model has been used in public health and in other contexts, but it's, it's widely used in public health. And it addresses four levels, if you will, the individual level, relationship level, community level, and societal level. And it looks at each of these levels and identifies what are the relevant risk factors and protective factors and how do they all interact with each other. A lot of the work on trafficking has been focused on the individual and some positive efforts, but it's only on the individual. So you see some efforts made by schools, and I think these are positive and well-intentioned efforts, but the, the effort is to um, introduce some educational programming, pub public awareness programming, around trafficking and, and teach kids. And, and that's important, but um, if that's just the individual level. If you don't address um, maybe unhealthy relationships that a child has, other risk, other individual level risk factors, what are the community-based factors? So what are the neighborhood factors? Is it a high crime area? What else is going on that puts the child at risk and makes them more vulnerable? Some of the so societal level factors that push particularly ch particular children to the margins. If you don't address all of those levels, then what you're really saying is, even though there's a ton of pressure on you as one, you, the child, um, we're gonna tell you some information and expect that you make the, the right choice. Uh, and that's expecting, if not the impossible, something close to the impossible. So the socio-ecological model helps us unpack the different levels that are affecting the lives of children and helps us identify where are there opportunities for intervention and how do we design more comprehensive programs. So organizations can start, organizations interested in addressing trafficking can start by using the socio-ecological model to understand the problem better and also understand where their work addresses the problem. If all you do is address the individual level, that doesn't mean you should stop doing what you're doing what it might mean is you need to partner with organizations that are doing community-based, relationship-based uh, programs mm -hmm. um, so that together you can create this integrated response um, that addresses the problem, reduces vulnerability. Uh, you recently, I saw, presented some of your research to the GRACE Commission, um, which stands for Georgians for Refuge, Action, Compassion, and Education which was created to combat the threat of human trafficking in the state of Georgia. And how do you hope your work might inform some of the approaches to trafficking here where it does remain quite a widespread problem? Yeah, so it's great to see that the governor's office is doing something. It's also, we, we happen to live in a state where there are a number of policymakers that are really ex interested and committed to addressing this problem. And that's a real strength of our community. We also have a wonderful anti-trafficking community here and they're really engaged. And, and so there's a lot of good news in, even though there's a lot we don't know and a lot of a lot to tackle, there's a lot of good news as well. Um, but as you identify and uh, as we identify in the book, um, there's a lot of work to be done. Um, and uh, of course the, the answer is if even one child is still being exploited, we should still be working at it. Um, but the reality is many children are, including in Atlanta and the state of Georgia more broadly. In our book, we outline a toolkit. It's really just a set of questions that an individual and organization can use to help guide their work. And we're hoping that that toolkit will be widely used. Um, the idea is it will help organizations understand what they're doing, where their work fits in uh, the bigger picture, understanding whether their work is evidence-based, does it actually contribute to prevention or does it address other elements 
and where can they supplement their work and strengthen their work. So hopefully by using that toolkit and some of the other things that we talk about in the book, um, what people are, will be able to do and organizations will be able to do is strengthen the work they're doing um, and ensure that it makes a difference and that it is effective in preventing harm from occurring. Um, and hopefully that gets us closer ultimately to reducing the prevalence and um, one day hopefully uh, addressing trafficking in its entirety. Well, thank you so much. This is inspiring and congratulations you. on your book. Thank you so much. Um, this has been an episode of the research podcast from Georgia State University featuring distinguished university professor of law and co-author of Preventing Child Trafficking, a Public Health Approach, Jonathan Tatras. For more conversations about research taking place across Georgia State, look for the research podcast wherever podcasts are found. And thank you so much for listening. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. <laughs>